So for those of you who don't know me, I do see a lot of familiar faces out in the audience. So I really appreciate uh, you guys coming. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Holly Oberly. Um, I'm an assistant professor here, new assistant professor here in uh, the political science uh, department here at CMU. Um, and I was very uh, honored to be asked to talk and to have my talk accepted. Um, before I get going, I just want to say a little bit about the topic of gender side. This is not exactly my field um, of expertise, um, but my field of expertise is kind of in the field of generally peace and conflict studies, international relations, world politics, but also in the field of gender and women's studies. So there is obviously some overlap um, between what I do, what I teach, what I research, um, and this talk. But this was actually, I, I welcomed this opportunity because the idea of gender side is something that I've always kind of wanted to delve more into, but never had the opportunity. And that's one of the great things about being an academic is sometimes you get opportunities to, to, to delve into topics um, that you otherwise probably wouldn't have time to do. So with that in mind, um, I will get started. Um, so the foremost, uh, expert or scholar in the field of gender side is a man by the name of Adam Jones. And he starts his book, which is also called Gender Side, with this very interesting quote, which was a quote sent by the United Nations Special Representative in the Balkans, um, two days into the massacre at Srebrenica. And that cable said, uh, we are beginning to detect a shortfall in our database. And what that essentially means was the United Nations at this time during the, the Balkans conflict, during the ba Bosnian war, they were set up largely um, as peacekeepers. Many people criticized their peacekeeping efforts uh, during that conflict, but they were also there basically to kind of count and to kind of keep track of people and numbers. And this was the cable that was sent because what happened was they were starting to detect the fact that a large number of people were missing in their database. And later it was discovered that a large number of people that were missing in their database were men. So what happened um, at Srebrenica without going into too much um, historical and uh, political detail was it was a series of, um, of civil uh, wars, ethnic conflicts um, throughout the 1990s. And I've given you kind of a map to give you a quick uh, snapshot of the various groups that were fighting uh, during the Bosnian Wars. Um, but the massacre that took place in Trebinica in 1995 is considered kind of one of the most uh, deadliest periods of that time. And what happened um, was that this was a, a period of days in which 8,000 uh, Bosnian, uh, Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslim, Muslims were killed and every single one of those 8,000 people were also men, okay? So it was this discovery um, that I think was the real world event that got Adam Jones and other scholars interested in not only genocide, but the gendered aspects of genocide. And um, in particular, uh, what Jones focuses on is the targeted mass killing of men. Um, but as we will see throughout this talk, I want to add a little bit of nuance to that. This week, throughout this Holocaust Awareness Series, is we're here to not only remember, commemorate the Holocaust, but also to put it in context of genocide in general. Um, <clears throat> and so it might be important to at least remind ourselves kind of what genocide is. I think we all know, but it's important to kind of really put a definition on it. And there are obviously lots of definitions out there, but the one I chose uh, was from a scholar by the name of Warren, who very simply, very clearly, very succinctly defined genocide as the deliberate extermination of a race of people. Which then, if you're gonna start thinking about the gendered aspects of genocide, you need to then define what gendercide is. And of course, as I said, the main scholar in this field is Adam Jones. He defines gendercide as simply the gender selective mass killing. Okay. So obviously these two things have very much in common. It's all about a targeted mass killing of a group of people. Um, <clears throat> and as I will contend, 
throughout this talk is that these two things actually work together fairly frequently and fairly consistently. The, extermin the deliberate attempt at an extermination of a race of people, but also a deliberate targeting of a specific gender. What I think is also important to notice about this term gender side is that it uses the word gender. We also have terms like infanticide, femicide, androcide. Uh, femicide refers to the targeted killing of women. Um, androcide to the targeted killing of men. Infanticide, the targeted killing of um, babies, of infants. But Jones very deliberately chose to use the term gender side because it is meant to be kind of an umbrella term, right? Gender refers to both men and women, as well as in between, right? Transgender, third genders. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's actually really, really important because sometimes when we think of gender, at least uh, in my experience, when we think of gender, we immediately think of women, we think of girls. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of university departments are called you know, departments of gender and women, <laughs> or a, uh, a course is often called gender and women. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but there is sometimes gender and women get linked into one thing. And it's important to realize that men also have gender, <laughs> okay? Um, and that men can also be, as I uh, started my talk with an example of, men can also be targeted uh, in gender side because of their gender. Okay, so this isn't just about uh, women. <clears throat> so that use of the word gender was very uh, specific, I think, and very deliberate by Jones. Okay. Now what I contend is all mass violence has a gender component, whether it's genocide, whether it's war, uh, <clears throat> whether it's police violence. There is a gender component to almost all mass violence, um, and that is a pattern that we can see historically, cross-culturally. This is a fairly consistent pattern. It's just, what are those patterns? They're not always consistent, but there is always a gendered component to violence. <clears throat> An easy example of this is simply looking at the way wars are traditionally conducted, right? And this is fairly easy. Traditionally, men are in the armies, right? And women are typically the ones that stay at home during war and are meant to kind of keep society running, protect the family, feed the children while men are at war. This is fairly consistent pattern that we see in wars throughout human history and cross-culturally, which shows you that conflict and war has a gendered component, right? <clears throat> so if genocide is a kind of mass violence, a particular kind of mass violence, and if you agree with me, that gender, there is a gendered component to almost all instances of mass violence, then genocide will always have a gendered component to it as well. It's just that that gendered component is not often uh, looked at, it's not often focused on. So that's what I'd like to do today. My main hypothesis or my main uh, message for you today is that uh, genocide is often characterized by a very specific gendered pattern, which is that men are the ones that are targeted for death and women are targeted for mass rape. I know, sorry, tough topics for today. <laughs> um, but that is, I think, a very consistent pattern that you see throughout a lot of modern genocides. Um, <clears throat> and I will give you some examples. <clears throat> and some of these examples deviate a little bit from that hypothesis, but uh, I think a lot of these examples are, are, are telling. So to start with, we should start with the Holocaust, since this is Holocaust Awareness Week. A scholar by the name of Goldhagen, he really focused on the liquidation of Soviet prisoners of war, that part of the Holocaust. Um, and he wrote a whole book about that. 
what he noticed during his study of, of this aspect of the Holocaust was that during the liquidation of the Soviet POWs, uh, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. What's also very interesting to understand about uh, the Soviet armies during World War II is that they actually did have all female units, um, <clears throat> which is somewhat uh, unusual. Uh, and we could talk a lot about why that is. It has a lot to do with communism and um, Soviet gender politics, but uh, the Soviet army did have all female units, um, which were also captured uh, during, the, uh, during World War II. But what he noticed is that the all female units were not sent to the death camps, but the all male units largely were. So this is an example of that kind of gendered pattern that we can see even in the Holocaust. Um, and it is estimated that 2.8 million Soviet POWs were, were, were killed, and most of those we know were men. I'd like to also go back in time a little bit before the Holocaust and talk about the rubber terror in the field from what I've been gathering, doing some research on this. In the field of genocide studies, this is kind of a controversial example, but I'll offer it to you anyway. Uh, this was a period of time during the Belgian uh, colonization of Congo, and um, <clears throat> this was a brutal colonization. And it's called the Rubber Terror because during this period of time, um, King Leopold, who was at the time the King of Belgium, uh, was uh, really keen on extracting the rubber out of the Congo. Uh, this, of course, requires a lot of intense labor. And um, as you can see from these uh, brutal pictures, people, if you refused to work or if you didn't work hard enough in the rubber fields, your first offense, your hand was cut off. <clears throat> so you can see a lot of the, the pictures. Um, this is a picture here of two Congolese uh, men holding the feet and the hands of an infant. So also babies were targeted uh, in order to send a message to work harder, work in the rubber fields. <clears throat> Men and women were targeted during this period of time. <clears throat> but what ended up happening is on your first offense, as I said, your hand was typically cut off. Second offense, you were killed. Or you're, you were killed if you were a man, you were raped if you were a woman. <clears throat> And the Congo has been dealing with the fallout of this gendered violence and this genocide for decades. Because as late as the 1970s, the population of women was nearly double that of men in many villages throughout the Congo, according uh, to Hochschild, who, who's done a lot of um, anthropological work in the Congo. So this, this pattern of killing men, you know, remained salient in Congolese society for a number of decades. We could fast forward to the communist, the anti-communist purges that took place in the 1960s in Indonesia. Again, in the field of genocide studies, this is a controversial uh, example, whether this constitutes a genocide because it was largely targeting communists and not a particular ethnic group. But again, I'm going to offer it to you as an example anyway. Um, <clears throat> as late as even in the early 2000s, there are some uh, villages in Indonesia, according to anthropologists, that still do not have male adults <clears throat> because of the gendered patterns of this anti-communist purge. What is interesting also about this example is that while uh, men were frequently targeted during these purges, um, there was one uh, women's organization that was also actually targeted, and it was a feminist organization called the Garwanis. Uh, this was a communist uh, uh, feminist organization, but they obviously, because they were associated with communism, was all, they were also targeted for death. This next example is one that I think kind of actually sparked my interest in this because it's very somewhat personal for me because I lived in Bangladesh for a number of years. I taught many Bangladeshi students and I still remain in contact with many of them. And 
when I would teach about gender and politics in Bangladesh, um, inevitably students would come up to me and want to talk after class and would tell me um, stories about what their parents, especially what their mother's experience during the Bangladeshi Liberation War in 1971. And the stories were fairly horrific, but they were very consistent. They were about rape. Um, <clears throat> this particular example has been studied, as I said, uh, a bit more than the others, as far as I can tell. Um, this, is a ver this was very deliberate strategy by the Pakistani army during this war of liberation, was to target uh, battle age men even if they were civilians, even if they weren't part of the army, um, target those for death, and then the systematic mass rape of Hindu women in Bangladesh. Pac uh, Muslim women were also uh, raped, but in particular, it was Hindu women that were targeted for this genocidal rape. <clears throat> this is so well known and such a part of Bangladeshi identity, I would say, that their independence memorial, this is a picture of their independence memorial in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, actually depicts a woman about to be taken to be raped. So this is very much a part of that story of their independence. Another example is the Khmer Rouge in um, Cambodia. <clears throat> Again, Simple population, simple demographics, modern demographics bear out what took place during uh, Pol Pot's reign in Cambodia. Um, 60 to 80 percent of the population in some parts of the country are women. So that shows, again, this targeting of men during the process of the genocide in Cambodia. I offer this also as an example because um, in the aftermath of, uh, of the conflict in Cambodia, a special tribunal was set up by the United Nations, which is fairly typical uh, after genocides. Um, but rape and sexual violence was actually not discussed during um, that United Nations tribunal. Um, but it has started to become part of the discussion and part of kind of the history and the reconciliation of this conflict. So there's a new tribunal, if you will. It's a joint tri tribunal that has recently been set up by the United Nations um, with the Cambodian government um, in, in order to investigate and, ra and research and adjudicate the systematic rape that took place uh, of uh, Cambodian women during uh, the genocide. Um, Mass rape was not discussed at the, at the United Nations at the first tribunal, largely because the Khmer Rouge kind of outlawed, uh, at least officially on paper, they outlawed rape. Um, and what they did have is they had what they called kind of arranged marriages. Um, and so a lot of the people assumed that there was not a lot of sexual violence um, that these arranged marriages were not exactly consensual marriages, but they didn't really recognize that these arranged marriages involved rape. But now um, that is starting to become part of the conversation. So this court was set up in 2005, and uh, a lot of this, the evidence for mass rape during this period of time is now being uncovered. Yet another example is Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, I think, is a fairly well-known genocide by now. So I won't spend a lot of time on Rwanda, but uh, Rwanda also has a lot of very interesting gender dynamics to it. Uh, mass rape was part of this conflict for sure. We know that for sure. Um, what's also interesting about this conflict from a gender perspective is that it started off really targeting men, but as the conflict continued, it actually started to, uh, to target women as the conflict continued. Ironically, for a variety of reasons, which of course we can talk about, and you can ask me about if you'd like, but for a variety of reasons, in the aftermath of the genocide in Rwanda, there was a new constitution and um, this actually led uh, to a female-dominated parliament, uh, one of the uh, first parliaments with more than 50% women in it. And that's even though women always constitute more than 50% of the population, they almost never constitute 50% of any government. 
Uh, so, but here is an example of that. So, uh, <clears throat> so maybe some light at the end of a very dark tunnel. What explains the mass targeting of men and the mass rape of women? In a way, it kind of is sad to say, but in a way it makes some sense. It makes some logical sense when you look at it from the lens of genocide, right? If genocide is the attempt at a mass extermination of a particular group of people, a particular ethnic or racial group of people, then the underlying logic and goals of ethnic cleansing actually in some ways logically lead to the mass targeting of men for death, right? Um, <clears throat> as well as the mass targeting of women for rape. If you kill the enemy men um, and you rape enemy women, that is, again, in some ways a logical way to try to create an ethnically pure and to purge a particular ethnic group from society, right? Um, but that, of course, relies on gender <clears throat> and gendered violence. Something else that might, that might help us understand this gendered aspect of genocide is thinking about genocide and ethnic cleansing as a kind of war, as a kind of conflict, which is very different than other kinds of conflict, right? I mean, human beings have fought over all kinds of different things throughout human history. Sometimes they're fighting over ethnicity, sometimes they're fighting over territory, Sometimes they're fighting over uh, resources. Sometimes they're fighting over who gets to be the next king or prince, right? Um, <clears throat> but there's something very different and something qualitatively different, I would say, and other scholars much smarter than me have said. Um, there's something very different about ethnic wars because you can't change your identity. Yeah, you can't change your ethnicity. Right? You're, but you can change your national identity. You can change your ideas. If it's a war of ideology, you can change your ideas. Territory can be negotiated. Water rights can be negotiated. Resources can be negotiated. But it's much more difficult to negotiate who you are. Yeah? <clears throat> and so that's why ethnic wars and genocide are so kind of difficult to negotiate, to solve, because you can't really change sides, <laughs> okay? Even if you wanted to, it's hard to change sides. And so that's, again, what leads to the mass targeting of men, even men that are civilians that are not formally part of the military, is because if you are part of that enemy ethnic group, you are a potential combatant, even if you are not formally in the military. <clears throat> and so I would argue that that is part of why we see this androcide aspect of genocide. However, unlike ethnic cleansing, it does not really depend on a hatred, right? Ethnic cleansing and genocide is partly or maybe mostly driven by a hatred, a desire to exterminate another group of people. Androcide and the targeted killing of men is not because they hate men, it's not because they want to exterminate men, but it's a very targeted strategy to exterminate an ethnic group. I hope that makes some sense. That's getting into some theory stuff that we political scientists like. I'd like to move in a slightly different direction and offer a few other examples um, of gendered, as gendered violence that might even constitute gender side. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the one-child policy in China, which started in the 1970s and was recently lifted. Now it's officially a two-child policy. <clears throat> Maybe some of you are familiar also with uh, the concept of sun preference, <clears throat> which, as you can see from this map, uh, sun preference is extremely common in China and India, as well as a few other examples up there, Egypt, another country I've lived in. Now, of course, this policy, the one-child policy, was completely gender neutral. It didn't say, oh, 
you know, you can only have one child and it has to be a man or it has to be a boy, but that's en that is what ended up happening. <clears throat> because in Chinese society, as well as most societies, most societies are patriarchal. China is a very patriarchal society and also patrilineal. So names, inheritance, uh, money, wealth is passed on through the, the male line. And so obviously if you are only in this kind of environment, if you're only allowed to have one child, you're going to want to have a male child. So this one child policy has resulted in um, a whole missing generation of women, of girls in China. Now in India, they have a similar problem, but not as direct because China, India does not have a one child policy, um, not at all. <clears throat> But China, India has uh, one of the highest rates of sex selective abortion in the world. And so similar problems, different from different places, but similar results have taken place in two countries that together represent a huge proportion of the world's population. Mm -hmm. So these two countries have a massive male surplus in their population. This graph uh, from The Economist kind of gives you a sense of the, the male surplus problem in both countries, as well as the what we call the marriage squeeze. So you might think to yourself, okay, is this really a problem? Does it really matter if there's you know, uh, a lot more men in society than, than women? Well, there's a whole bunch of political scientists that study this problem and they would say yes this this means there's going to be big problems in these societies in a country where men are still the primary breadwinner okay you have a whole bunch of men who now there are not going to be enough jobs for and of course, that is a problem that maybe a lot of societies are experiencing, not enough jobs for people. But again, this is a particular gendered issue because men are really under a lot of pressure, especially I can speak very clearly about Chinese society because I also live there. Um, they, men in, in Chinese society are under a lot of pressure to have, have a family, provide for the family, get a job, get a good job. But if you can't, then you're not kind of fulfilling your cultural expectations. Not only that, but because of this male surplus, there's not enough women to marry. And again, in a society that very much values family and tradition, and that is your expectation, is to get married, to provide for a family. If you cannot do either of those things, you can imagine the kind of frustration that that might cause. And now think of that kind of frustration in a population of over a billion people. So the theory about what this could cause is a phenomenon that maybe awkwardly is called increased male congregation. Okay, so there's, you can't marry, you are unemployed, what are you gonna do? Hang out with other men, which may not, which over time and in massive numbers could cause all kinds of problems. Increased arbitrary violence, increased Gang violence, especially worrisome, increased domestic violence against women, against girlfriends. <clears throat> but also important to our topic today, which is genocide, ethnic violence. Because we know one of the primary drivers of the Holocaust in particular, but also genocide in general, when a society has a group of people to blame or to be scapegoated for the ills of society, that is one of the sparks that tends to light the flame of genocide. So if you have a group of a, a society in which you can't get married, you can't fulfill your cultural obligations, or you don't have enough jobs, they might find a scapegoat. This is particularly worrisome, I think, in India because India is a very ethnically diverse country. Finally, I'd like to offer one other example, which is uh, a gender side within 
the genocide of the Native Americans here in this country. <clears throat> so Hoya is the Spanish term for third gender. So this is what the Spanish colonizers called third gender or what we would refer to as transgender individuals. Um, <clears throat> Now, of course, we know, and I know there's going to be, I think it's actually later tonight at 6.30, um, there's going to be a, a, a much larger talk about the genocide of the native population here in this country. So we know that that was a massive genocide here, but within that, there was a gender side of this third gender, or the Hoyas, <clears throat> what is also sometimes called two-spirit individuals. Um, I would contend that this is a gendercide because, even though it was in the context of a larger genocide, this was a, what happened during Spanish colonization, particularly in, Calif in what is now California, um, these third gender individuals were specifically targeted with a kind of killing. The way that these individuals were murdered, dogs, were used against them. And this was a kind of killing that was used specifically for these third gender individuals. So I would call that a gender side, because again, it was targeted. <clears throat> but I think it's also important that we recognize that gender side isn't just men, women, there's also all kinds of in between, right? So with that, my final thoughts are that I would leave you with is as you reflect about the Holocaust today uh, and this whole week, um, keep the gendered aspect of genocide and of any mass violence in mind. It is often not at the forefront, but it really drives some of these conflicts in, in some cases. I think that taking the gendered aspects of these events into consideration can help us understand them better actually help us understand the motivations of these events better, which hopefully understanding leads to prevention, <laughs> leads to a more full understanding and prevention in the future. I think that's the whole goal of events like this is to hopefully um, prevent future genocides. <clears throat> and then finally, I'd also leave you with this last thought, which is, um, Gendered violence, no matter what kind of violence it is, gender side, genocide, war, ethnic cleansing, even domestic violence, everyday violence, <clears throat> always has a gendered aspect to it and always has a very important long lasting effect on society. Just like I tried to demonstrate with the, <clears throat> the long lasting effects of the one child policy, these have long lasting long term effects on society that we need to think about and they need to take into consideration. And with that, that is all I have for you today, but I'm happy to take questions or engage in an informal discussion. So thank you so much. <clears throat>